Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, today I'll give you a talk about why and how to deploy secure computation. You know that uh, uh, part of the internet infrastructure rather than the regular infrastructure is uh, uh, forming a new, a new economic, a new economy in, in a sense, and uh, we need to uh, to use it. And we have security and privacy constraints that don't allow us. So I will tell you a bit how to how to do it. It is a, an example of a, one project that I was doing in Google. So secure computing protocol. It's an involved area. It started in the 70s after public key was invented. People noticed that many interesting and uh, problems that when you look at them you see that you cannot really uh, solve from information theoretic point of view then with public key cryptography from a complexity point of view you can solve them. So it became very rich area of research in cryptography it's essentially theoretical area very surprising results like you can play mental poker over the net you can uh, flip a coin over the net and, and, and uh, you can do many things and and, and really uh, it started with like simple protocols like mental poker protocol in uh, 1979 and then there was an, an, another mental poker protocol in 82 and then uh, uh, oblivious transfer oblivious transfer is a, it's a very simple protocol uh, you, you send the, the mail and I send you mail and maybe you get it, maybe not, and I don't know the result. And uh, flipping coin by telephone and secure computation, which is like the millionaire problem to do comparison. So you look at these papers that started the field and uh, you think it's just recreational mathematics because the problems are, they look like uh, puzzles. So it looks like not not so serious, but you look at the people, the authors, and you see they all go Turing Award. So something is serious about this area. Okay? Uh, so it became a general theory. Uh, there are general results. Two party computations can compute uh, uh, on their inputs with, without learning the inputs. Only the output gets known. And the same thing for multi-party computation, many people working together, contributing inputs, and you will learn only the result. So it's like we do, we share the computation, but uh, we share the output, but we don't learn each other input. So I know in, in Spain is about to do election, so you can do election protocol over the internet, everybody vote, you get the right result, you get the correct result, everybody votes the count, but you don't know the individual vote because it's a democracy. So um, this can be like viewed as partial information game and one example is zero knowledge proofs. There's a special case. And we also have uh, theory for special protocols like election, auctions, payments, data mining, how to do it, securing the inputs. Okay? So, uh, in, and in recent years, people started to say, this has been too, much, too theoretical, only theory. Let's try to do something practical. And the practice of things and accelerating things and getting things in uh, lower complexity and fast is challenging and it brings new techniques into the area. Okay? And there are now uh, five startups, startup companies in the area trying to bring secure computation to practice. Okay? So I noticed that the secure computation is not so much used in practice. There are only these startups. And for me, secure computation is the third generation of cryptography. There was uh, symmetric key, which was in the 70s. Public key, which took off mainly with, in the 90s with the internet. We run 
HTTPS, SSL protocols on the internet. It's being, these are being used a lot. But secure computation does not, did not uh, gain this uh, usability, usefulness. So I wanted to show that if you can do something uh, beneficial, so I said it's not, there is no benefit unless it's beneficial. And this is the picture of the guy who in, a, in the, the US always say this thing. He said it's not over until it's over and things like this. He's famous for this. He actually died this year. But he has all this uh, statement. He also, he also said, they asked him about all the things that he was saying. He said, half of the thing I said, I did not say. So, okay. All kinds of strange things. And then, I, when I uh, decided to work on this, I asked some uh, cryptographers, what do they think? And I asked them what will be a success to show that secure computation can uh, actually work in practice. So one cryptographer said, we need a business application which runs routinely on, on, on business needs. Second cryptographer said, high impact business application will be a good uh, demonstration that this technology is real beyond just writing papers. And the third cryptographer said, when I suggest such protocols, I am told that no engineering team in the company will be able to implement it. So I concluded it's theory, that's it. Don't waste time, okay. So, let me a little bit tell you the difference between uh, scientific, uh, theoretical research and practice. So, how does a typical paper in, in, in theory look like? You have to present a problem, you have to argue that it is important, it has application and so on, and you need to convince people to accept it, the way you write it, it you have to solve the problem, using the tools and the language of your peers, more or less, so people understand what you are doing. Either you solve the problem or you solve some relaxation of the problem, and you argue how the solution has nice applications and implications. Yes? This is the way you, uh, a typical scientific uh, paper look like. If it's a more experimental area, you have to do experiments and you have to do demonstration. If it's a, Theoretical paper, you have to write a theorem and, 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 and prove to it. Okay. I will skip the joke there, which is the, the chicken and the egg. Okay, I, oh, you want the joke? Yes. So the joke is the problem and the relaxation thereof. So you have to be careful with the relaxation because uh, one guy said, uh, wrote a paper and he said, uh, he called it on the problem of the chicken and the egg. And he said, it's a very old problem. What came first, the chicken and the egg? And philosophers have been arguing about this for thousands of years. So I will solve here a relaxed version of the problem. Hopefully, it will shed light on the original problem. And the version I solve is the, the chicken and the boiled egg who came first. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be careful in the relaxation. OK. <laughs> but business is different than theoretical papers. So you need incentive and you need clear benefits to even start to talk about it. And the need for crypto may come from different reasons, not just the reason that you have a great idea and uh, you want to use it. And, and you need that there will be awareness and knowledge of the business issues and the engineering and product plan and software development plan. And if you want to put it in business, you have to be a product manager, verifying the company where, how, and what is it really needed. Otherwise, don't even start. And you need to propose solutions, not, not really a, a technical area. What actual problems it solves, and why it is uniquely positioned to do it. Because <coughs> many times people suggest something, but there will be alternatives to solving it, either in the trust model or in the way I will add another computer, I put it in a second room and I solve it. I don't need cryptography or things like this. You know, for, 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 for TLS over the internet, uh, you have to use cryptography if you want security. You cannot use uh, something else. You cannot use uh, 
mail pigeons with uh, sealed envelopes. It doesn't work over the internet. But uh, for, for computation, you may put computers in a different room and, uh, and then destroy the computer. Maybe you don't need protocols. People can argue. And so you, you need to position it well to solve it and uh, you need to know where and how to use the opportunity in the overall uh, product context. You, you, you need not start wars that you are not going to win. It's very important for credibility. So you, and, and the goal is to start with problems and issues, really. So it's, it's totally different. It's like we start with big science, we run experiments or solve some problem theoretically and we prove that it is and then we claim applications. In, 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 in the industry, you have to start from applications, see, analyze it, see that you need, and then eventually reach the scientific solution. So it's bottom up rather than, than top down, because otherwise it will not work. And there are many examples of uh, failures in this area. So what I will show you now in the time that I don't have, or I don't know, I have a little time, yeah. Uh, I will show you some, some uh, new application, which is, is called Private Data Exchange, and it's an inter internet collaboration. So the first thing is where to deploy. So secure computations are heavy. They require uh, overhead, because you need to encrypt, you need to communicate, you need to compute. It's, it costs more than computing on clear data, of course. So offline computation that is important and critical to the company is a good way to start, not something that runs online. So imagine if I came to, to Google and I said, let's instead of doing search from users, let's do encrypted search. The user will encrypt the query and we will search the internet on encrypted, encrypt the internet and we'll do all this encryption and you type your search and after three days you get the result. <laughs> Not so good. So therefore it has to be offline in some sense. And then it has to be involved, the data from different companies. And these companies have to have some privacy or sharing restrictions, either by regulation or because of privacy of their users, data of users and things like this. And they cannot really share it. And you need the sharing. <clears throat> and you also have to be in a position that all alternatives of doing it can be easily dismissed, rejected. And then you can try even to think, this is even before thinking about what cryptography I'm going to use. I have to find a situation that is important, is people need it, and, uh, and uh, has this characteristic. And originally, I found about this problem in a talk of the chairman of the company that there's a big problem because blah, 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 blah. Uh, so we design concrete implementation system to solve the, the problems, the, pro the following problem. So there is a content provider, let's call it G, and it has information about users, what they view. And there is a, a second, uh, party called transaction provider or merchant M, it has a spend value of users. Who paid what and how much? Who, which users paid and how much? And there is a way for G and M to agree on the names of, of those users. And the goal is to discover the spend value for a set of users of G per merchant, per M, to assess the correlation of viewing versus spending. Because G has viewing information and M has spending information. 
So we, lo we want to let G know how much is the spend value of all the people that we're viewing and the number of spenders, let's say. <coughs> and we need to compute this, and that data cannot be exchanged. So the pro we call the problem the private data exchange. So in one side, there is the viewing, viewing information, who see what on the internet. On the other side, there is spending, and we want to see how much the viewing affect the spending. And it's very important for internet infrastructure economy. Okay? So let's start with a simple protocol if we don't have any privacy problem. So G has a set of IDs, G1, G2, and M has M1, M2, and they're spending S1, S2. So we want G to learn uh, how much people in his list actually spent. So the merchant M send M1, S1, M2, S2. And then uh, all G has to do is find which M I is in his list and uh, count it and add the S I's from the, the list. So it does set intersection between G, G I's and M I's and adds the sum of the spending S I's. Yes? Very simple protocol. You know, sum the spends of all IDs in common. And we know how to do set intersection very fast. Let's say we sort it or something and we see uh, intersection, merge, merge sort kind. So, however, it reveals to G all the users of M and reveals to G all their spendings and the total spending. And we, we didn't want G to know this. We, remember, we wanted only the sum and the number. So, we wanted to find the sum and the spend such that M finds nothing about the IDs in G's or the sum spend. Maybe he has an upper bound on the, on, on, on the list of G, but not more. And G finds only the aggregate information, the size of the set of users in common, and the total spend value. And they both learn the, an upper bound on their, their size of their lists, okay? So, if only G learns the, how many users are in common and the total spend, then we achieve our goal, the privacy goal, the security goal. Okay? <coughs> so let's try to, first step, just to protect the spend value. So we have a linear homomorphic encryption that can do uh, addition without uh, decrypting. For example, uh, Paillet encryption. So if we have uh, encryption of S1 and encryption of S2, if we multiply these encryptions, we get the encryption of S1 plus S2. And this is pretty efficient. So, what we do is instead of sending the SI, we send the encryption of SI, let's say with Paye. And G find the common IDs from the set intersection and multiply their spend. E equals ES, all those multiplication, they call it E in step three. He sends this to M. M is the owner of the Paye key. He has the private key. He decrypts E and send back S, which is the sum of the SI. Okay? So this is a way to use uh, linear homomorphic encryption to do this. Does it, solve, does it solve our problem or did we make any progress? 
Yes, we don't know in the individual spans, but in order for G to find the span, M finds the span. Because the Payeki is M's key, when we send E to M, it decrypts it and sends S back, which is the decryption, and this is the sum. So M also learned this. Uh, it's too much information. Okay, so let's force solve this. And the idea is to do the same thing, but use the fact that this is a linear homomorphic encryption. So I can blind the sum. I can encrypt random number here into the real sum in the intersection. Gets back S, which is this random number plus the real sum. So M doesn't learn the sum because this R randomizes it. And this IG who chose R, this is public key encryption. So here I choose R, I encrypt and I multiply. I get back S, I can take S minus R, this is the real sum. So we solve that problem. So there is a blinded sum, it's very simple, relatively simple operation that we can do to find the, uh, the result. So this just solve how to deal with the spin. But it revealed all the IDs of the merchants, M, M1, M2, and so on, to G. And that's too much. We have to solve this. And to do this, we use, uh, we use a specialized, special uh, secure multi-party computation called private set intersection. Yes, we can do it. Private set intersection. It's a very current, very well studied. It appears in many conferences. People write uh, papers about this problem. And, uh, and uh, if we can solve it, so here is an abstract way of solving it. If we have a trusted set, set intersection, we could have G sending its list to this intersection, M sending its information. This does the intersection securely, send only the individual spans here to G, so G learned the cardinality of the set, how many elements are here is how many people are in the intersection. And then it runs the blinded sum, it adds R, gets the result, and gets the, the sum. Okay, so if we had the trusted set intersection, uh, we solved it. So we needed to solve a trusted set intersection in the context of what we do. So the, the, to solve the blinded sum, we use Paye. Paye is a cousin of RSA encryption. RSA encryption, the entire internet uses in TLS to do the secure, the secure channel, the authenticated secure channel. So with Paya, we can uh, convince regulators that the encryption is secure already. It's, uh, it's been there at least 15 years, and it's a cousin of RSA. So now we have to solve a uh, set intersection and do the same convincing, OK? So uh, we want to take the trusted third party because there is no trusted third party, really, in reality. Because if we had trusted third party, humanity would have been much better. <laughs> there would be need no lawyers. But you maybe have of law somewhere in Spain. <laughs> so there are no trusted third party. <laughs> so So we want to use uh, something, and here is something that can solve trusted set intersection. Uh, if we have a, a commutative encryption, if we apply uh, G of M and, and applies to it F of G, 
of m, and if we apply f of m and apply g of f of m, if it's the same m, we get the same value. So this could have solved the uh, set intersection, and then we'll combine it with the blinded sum. So, so there is a commutative encryption scheme, and this is before RSA, it's called Pauli-Mielman encryption. F of M is M to the E1 mod P, P a prime, so it's RSA modulo a prime with a fixed exponent. And the other guy have G, which is E2 mod P in the same, in the same group. <coughs> And of course, m to the e1 to the e2 equals m to the e2 e1 because it's exponentiation. It doesn't, doesn't matter how you do. And this is from 76. Haven't been used in system. In 80, Shamir has a paper that says, ah, we have commutativity here if we have two poly -Gelmans. Nowadays, of course, we can do, uh, so this were presented before even we needed to prove that crypto systems are secure. 76, you know, it's the prehistory of modern cryptography. Uh, nowadays, we can also do it over elliptic curve groups with more efficiency and, and, and smaller space. And, uh, and, uh, we will use it not as an encryption, but as a commutative joint hash of the two parties. We never do decryption. Okay? And uh, the, the decryption, uh, so uh, Polly Gelman used it for decryption, and the exponent was shared between the receiver and the sender because it's a private key system. And if you know E, you can find E inverse modulo phi of p, because p is a prime, you know, Fermat's, not last theorem, but first theorem. <laughs> so, you know, these things were, were known from the prehistory. And we can, uh, we can do poly Gelman. Now we can show that this is secure based on the Decision Diffie Hellman group for random for random messages. So if I published R for a random number and R to the E1 mod P, then for a random message M and M to the E1 E2, I cannot the, the decision Diffie Hellman tells me this is indistinguishable if I choose here a random element in this group. So there is a formalized assumption. And this is the assumption that made the Diffie-Hellman key exchange work. So poly gelman crypto system is very similar to Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So everybody uses Diffie-Hellman key exchange to secure the internet. So this is a cousin of Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So now you can convince them that this is secure. This has been here for, 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 for 40 years and nobody broke it and we have a proof of security. And uh, to make sure that the messages are random, we use some random oracle hash of the IDs. And we can build uh, the following uh, set intersection protocol. So instead of sending uh, G1 and so on, we'll send the exponentiation of G1 and so on. GN, I call it G, just symbolic notation. But it is this exponent. This is like hashing the GI and then exponenting it with a random exponent. <coughs> M has another exponent, this function F, E2 in the previous slide, and it applies uh, this to the first list. And also randomizes the order of the list, permuting. So here, when I get back the list, double encrypted list, I don't know which element is which. Even though originally it's G1 and G2 
our G's element, he doesn't know which one is in this list. M also apply the his exponentiation to his own list. Okay? So G can take his function G, applies it to the list of the elements from M, and uh, then he finds the blinded uh, intersection. So he, he, he sees how many elements in this list equal elements in this list. Because of the permutation, he doesn't know the actual uh, membership. So we learn just the size of the intersection list. Because this is permuted. In applications that we want him to learn who are the elements in the set, we don't permute the list. And that's very nice to have, how do you say it? Un tiro dos pájaros? <laughs> so we can do set intersection and size of set intersection in the same uh, method. And that's the comment that we can also do set intersection. So, so now we just combine the two protocols. So we have uh, we have G encrypts, get double encryption of his list, randomized and encryption of the other list, double encrypts the other list, find the intersection take the spins which are sent together with the elements of, of M with pi A, take them, multiply them, choose this R, encrypt it in, send, get back, and find the spin. All I claim now, and of course there is a proof based on decision defi Elman and pi A security, all G learn is this sum S, and of course the size of the intersection. And G and M learns nothing. Of course, it learns the sizes of the, they, they share the sizes of, of the lists. Actually, an upper bound on the sizes of the list because you can always add some dummy random IDs and zero spending as you want. Okay? But this was allowed in the game. So this is, uh, and, and if you see each, each element, each, each uh, side encrypted uh, for each group element twice. The original, the first encryption can be done offline to your list, not in the, during the time of the protocol. So the Paye encryption and the, the first uh, exponentiation can be done offline and we can accelerate it. But uh, essentially linear number of, of, of encryption in the sizes of, of the two lists. So it's uh, relatively doable. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not trivial because these lists are not small, but, but we can do it and uh, we can find out something that we could not find before. And we have to convince the partners that it is okay. So we use relatively old encryption tools. It's, you know, in in, uh, in a scientific paper, if you send it to a top conference and you use something from 30 years, they may say, ah, it's not fashionable anymore. <laughs> because they are running fast. Uh, they're using, you know, there, there is a trend in cryptography to use unverified assumptions now, yeah? I call it unicorn graphy. <laughs> Okay, so this is basic solution, and it's assume honest parties that they follow the protocol. This is the, we have a basic one, we have a reverse one in which M actually does the does the blinding rather than uh, than G, and uh, and some in some use cases we need to do it this way, but this is just a modification of the protocol. M does the blinding and uh, G accumulates and uh, un, 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 M does the accumulation and, and, and so on. Uh, 
By the way, in some application, you may want more than just this. Uh, if you, so this gives you the average of spending. If you want standard deviation and, uh, and other higher moments in statistics, you can do it by encrypting this, for example, for standard deviation, if you also encrypt with Payet the squares of the elements, you know that uh, from some of, some of the squares and, the, and, the, and square of the sums, you can exactly get the, the standard deviation. So if it's needed, we can do extra calculations for this. Okay, so we can solve it. Uh, uh, we can uh, add other solution, robustness, to, to make sure that uh, the, uh, the other side follows the protocol. If, so of course, these are two businesses, they have contracts, some people we believe will follow the protocol, but if they don't, then there is a way <coughs> to, to enforce it cryptographically. And uh, there's a lot of optimization. So for example, we can accelerate Paye encryption 40 times just because of the fact that M encrypts the value and M knows the secret key. So you encrypt with the knowledge of the secret key with Paye you can accelerate the computation 40 times. And we found it because in this application, it happened to be this way. And uh, it's in experiments now, and the goal is to move it to run uh, regularly as needed. So conclusions. How am I doing with time? Ah, it's okay. So if you think about business like uh, the deal with a lot of data, cryptography is the anti-data. So people don't understand it and they want everything to be not secure, but you know, they have privacy. But you show them that they can actually use it and it can enable them more processing and more analysis and that, that's good. And the way to do it is to analyze the real needs and then use the real uh, mentality of product and software development and then, then you can do it. And then you have to use the right tools for the right reasons. And uh, crypto and engineering, so well, what we can learn from this. So there is no fixed recipe for this just general principles and results, uh, it's uh, like in systems paper, but it's much less structured than in crypto papers. And business adaptation is, is, is challenging. It required the right interpretation of the theory. You cannot use the theory as is. You, you need to really understand what to use from the theory. The theory takes you up to some point and then you have to use other means. Attack, attack models, risk management, and incentives and liabilities are a big part of, of understanding what can be done or what cannot be done. Still, secure components and proofs and, uh, and theory, it matters. For example, we didn't, want to use, we, we didn't want to use any encryption that is just heuristics without proof of security in some sense, and something that is not there at least 10 years and people really uh, uh, trust it in some sense. You know, those, those encryption systems are not in OpenSSL and other standard cryptographic packages. We had to develop our own, so, but you have to make sure that, that, that it's there. The aesthetics is different than in theory. In theory, you need an elegant solution and a smart proof and new techniques. And here is solving very real and critical issues based on large philo of study and, and, and many, many constraints. And navigate, you have to navigate all this mess. Yeah? You have to, to find your way. But doing things and overcoming the mess is the definition of elegance in some sense. Okay, 
So thank you very much.